Shalom. Today we are continuing to discuss the correlation between the astronomical signs on the ecliptic and the corresponding Hebrew month. We are currently in the third month, which is known as Sivan. The name Sivan appears one time in Esther 8.9. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is, the month of Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordechai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants and the deputies and rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, and hundred twenty and seven provinces, unto every province, according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language. There is no uh, known root for Sivan. It appears to come from a, uh, a Persian root, but we can find some cognate ideas in the Hebrew. The word Masveh is translated as Zaveil. It only appears these three times in Exodus 34. Um, here's one example, verse 35. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. So uh, this root, uh, Samech Vav He, carries an idea of covering. Another word, probably from this root, appears in Genesis 49.11. The word is in Hebrew is sut binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes so again the idea of clothes that are uh, covering this word is used only ever once there's an apparent cognate root which is zion vav he and uh, this also does not appear very much but interestingly, uh, two words seem to be related to it. They're both in Psalm 144, uh, verses 12 and 13. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, and that our daughters may be as cornerstones. Uh, the word there is zaviot, or the singular is zavit. I've given you the Strong's number. Polished after the similitude of a palace. So if we think about the cornerstone, of a building, the building is built up upon it, and so it is something which becomes covered. Uh, verse 13, that our garners, menu, uh, which is Strong's number 4200, may be full, according, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and tens thousands in our streets. Again, the garner is a place where the grain is being stored, and so it covers the grain. So Sivan, the name of the month, comes with an idea of something being covered. Possibly the ground is covered with all kind of vegetation. We're uh, in the uh, month where things are really starting to come out, plants and covering the ground with all kinds of flowers and plants and trees. I found it interesting that the uh, daughters are considered to be the cornerstones. Uh, in light of this comment, this is from the Talmud, Tractate Yevamot, uh, from Rav Asi. Nowadays, if a Gentile should betroth the Jewess, there is reason for regarding the betrothal as not, therefore, invalid. Um, this sort of thing is frowned upon that Jews should marry Jews, but what he is saying that there could be a reason, there is a reason that the betrothal would be okay. It's not invalid, they could get married. For he, the Gentile man, may be a descendant of the 10 tribes and so one of the seed of Israel. So the woman is generally the one who is considered to be carrying the faith, she's the Jewess, She's carrying the tenets of the faith with her through the generations. The man may come from the outside. He may, uh, in other words, cover up, because he's not a believer, he may cover up the true faith 
and she is covered but she is still the foundation stone and she's still teaching through the generations we see that uh, in modern rabbinical thought Jewishness is really determined by the matriarchal line so that gives us some insight into that now several things have happened in the third month Leviticus 23 16 17 we are finished counting the Omer and we are told what to do even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath and ye number 50 days we're finished counting the Omer and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh he shall bring out of your of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals and they shall be a fine flour they shall be bacon with leaven they are the first fruits unto Yahweh. This is the beginning of the wheat harvest. It's the beginning of uh, the major harvest, which is going to be carrying on through the end of Sukkot. We see an unusual offering here because it's baked with leaven. It's the only one of all the meal offerings that have leaven in them. In Second Chronicles 31.7, in the third month they began to lay the foundation of the heaps in other words they are bringing in the the foundational harvest uh, the wheat is coming in and and it makes the foundation for the food for the year and they finished them in the seventh month so we see the people are bringing their harvest offerings from this time the month of Sivan, the beginning of the wheat harvest, until the end of Sukkot in the seventh month. If we count the Omer carefully from where we left, we probably starting somewhere around the 16th of the first month, the month of Nisan. So perhaps we have about 14 days left uh, to count in it. The entire second month of ER is 29 days. And now we're coming into Sivan, we get to the seventh day and we are at the 50th day so uh, here it's talking about in Exodus in the third month we're in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt remember they left uh, on the 15th of the first month of Nisan the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai so it is at this time that God meets them on the mountain uh, in Sinai and delivers to them the ten sayings the ten commandments uh, through Moses on the mountain a parallel event happens about 1500 years later uh, Yeshua has been raised and taken back into heaven he tells the disciples to wait the day of Pentecost has come that is the day of the uh, the 50th day Pentecost comes from the 50th day it's the festival of weeks and he tells him to wait in Jerusalem until they're endued with power on high now they were all going to go to Jerusalem this is one of the holidays where it's required for the men to go so the fact that they're all sitting in Jerusalem when this happens is not a surprise to anybody they've been doing it for 1500 years they've been going up to Jerusalem the disciples were all there Yeshua told them to wait there and uh, when that day came they were all with one accord in one place and you know that the Holy Spirit was poured out at that time so we're going to look at some parallels between this festival of Shavuot of weeks after counting the seven weeks Pentecost it's a 50th day between what happened at Sinai and what happened in the temple on that day in the first century Sinai is a wilderness it's an old nearless place it's a public place the Jews cannot claim it no individual tribe can claim it the Pentecost event happened in a public place it was at the temple and there were people from every nation there the rabbis teach that at Sinai every person was converted that day and we see that uh, in Jerusalem the people repented and they were baptized and their minds were changed at Sinai we see that fire came down on the mountains 
Uh, it is also taught by the rabbis that sparks of fire came down on the head of each person. And we see in Acts that tongues of fire rested on uh, the heads of each of the disciples there. As a result of the golden calf event, Le the Levites slew 3,000 sinners. And we see a, a reconciliation of that in the fact that 3,000 were baptized on the day in Jerusalem. It is taught in the Talmud in Shabbat 88b that the Torah was spoken in all 70 languages and we see the disciples speaking in tongues in Jerusalem. If you read the commandments as they're given um, on the tablets we can see that they are addressed to in the singular to each single person and that they were of one mind. The people were of one mind, and we see that also in Acts. It says the same thing. Sinai is the birthday of the called out assembly. It's the beginning of the called out assembly. We are taught that the Jacob's family went down into Egypt. They went down a family, but they came out a nation, and at Sinai they received the uh, the rules, the instructions for how their nation was to behave themselves. And uh, the word for uh, assembly there is kahal, and it means that they are called out. Uh, in some churches it is taught that Pentecost is the birthday of the church. The word for church is ecclesia. You can see that it has the same idea. It means also to be called out. This word, ecclesia, is used 91 times in the Septuagint, beginning with Leviticus and ending in Micah. So it's only mentioned once in the King James where it says the church in the wilderness. Otherwise, when the ecclesia refers to something that happened in the Old Testament, they, they translate it as, as assembly. Now, this was somebody's decision. The idea that the church is something new, that happened, that Yeshua came to start something different than what was happening before is a false idea. God has had his people uh, even since the days of Abraham, but as, a, as an assembly, as a nation, since they're coming out of Egypt, those people have belonged to God. There was always provision for anyone from the outside who wanted to come in and belong to the people of God all they had to do was move in with some tribe and begin keeping the instructions. The only thing that happened at Pentecost in the first century was that the door became open for the Gentiles to become members of the faith by faith. Nothing new was established in terms of who are the people of God. We're going to look at that in a minute, what happened. But it's very clear that the Holy Spirit was given and it was absolutely necessary so that people could understand what was happening with the Gentiles at that time. In Acts 15, we see that there's been a great discussion about what to do. It's a big problem. All these nations are coming in to what was always the church. It was always a called out assembly. And, and the Jews, the people of Jewish faith that were there, who were watching this phenomenon, were flummoxed. They didn't understand what was happening. So there's having a lot of disputing. Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles, the nations, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. They needed the Holy Spirit, the action of the Holy Spirit in the people, to understand that this is what God was doing at that time. When they saw all the events, the fire on the head, the speaking of, in tongues, the 3,000 saved, those, those disciples in the first century perfectly understood 
that this is a replay, a parallel event to Sinai. They can recognize all the signs. And just as the people, the tribes in the desert, were considered to be converted on that day, they are understanding this is what is happening to the Gentiles, to the people of the nations. James then quotes, he says, Simeon, as Peter, has declared how God had the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written after this I will return I'm quoting from Amos and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called saith the Lord who doeth these things so they have this revelation they can see the events and then suddenly the prophecy becomes clear to them yes the Gentiles will be accepted in by faith there's no more requirement of biology the constellation over this month is Gemini the twins the word in Hebrew is to Amim we see it twice Genesis 25 24 and when her days were to be delivered were fulfilled behold there were twins in her womb uh, speaking of Jacob and Esau in Genesis 38 27 and it came to pass in the time of her travail that behold twins were in her womb uh, speaking of Tamar the twins uh, parrots and Zerach there is a verb root to Am which is used to describe the bores and sockets as they put together for the Mishkan. Exodus 26, 24, and they shall be coupled together beneath, and they shall be coupled together above the head of it unto one ring. Thus shall it be for, both, for them both. They shall be for the two corners. It's interesting that one of the disciples is named Toma. He has the root in his name for being a twin. John 11:16 then said Thomas, which is called Didymus. Didymus is the Greek word that means twins. Unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So Toma is his Hebrew name. It means twin. And he is called Didymus in Greek because he is a twin. Mythology of the Gemini is that they are uh, twins called Castor and Pollux. So very interestingly, Paul is on a ship in Acts 28:11. After three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign, in other words, the name of that ship was Castor and Pollux. And what do we find out in Romans 11:13? Paul says, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. So here we have the picture of the Gentiles coming in to the fold, into the faith of God. They're going to be equal heirs and members of the family of God. When we see that offering with the leaven, uh, we have two loaves for the offering for Shavuot, for Pentecost. They have leaven in them. It's a picture of the Gentiles coming in to faith. Now, it's very interesting. Castor and Pollux in the mythology are considered to have two different fathers. They have the same mother, but they have two different fathers. This is biologically possible, and as a matter of fact, last month there was a case uh, came to light in Vietnam where a man's wife had twins, and the man said, yes, that one is mine, but the other one is not mine. And so he did go to, uh, to the hospital in the city, and they did DNA testing, and he was right. Only one of the children was his. So if you need more biological information about how that can happen, you can research it yourself. Genesis 21:12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight, because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. He's talking about... Um, Ishmael and Hagar, whom he's having to put out. But God says, And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, 
Hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. We have this idea that even though they are brothers, even though they have the same father, even though one is older than the other, it's God determines which one has God's seed, which one is going to follow the word of God, which one is going to carry the line of Messiah. And Paul repeats this in uh, Romans 9, 7, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. It's not about actually who your father is, but in Isaac thy seed be called. Yeshua further elucidates this idea, and he's talking many, many times to the people, the people who were Jews, the people, the Hebrew people that are still living in the land, and he refers to God as their father who cares for them, and gives them what they need, he gives them the good gifts. But then at the same time in John 8, he makes this speech, Yeshua said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You of a, are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And the people are protesting, no, God is our father, Abraham is our father. But Yeshua says, no, you have a different father. It's not about the biology, it's about spiritual truth. So now we come to the reconciliation of the twins. The twins are Jacob and Esau. In Genesis 33, 12 to 14, And he, that is Esau, said, let us take our journey and let us go, and I will go before you. And he, that is Jacob, said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds are with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly, according as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children be able to endure, until I come unto my Lord, unto Seir. Seir is a dome, it is the place of Esau. It is his habitation. So they have had this uh, reconciliation after Jacob's been gone all this time. Esau shows up with 400 men, and Jacob's afraid, and he divides the camps. But when Esau and Jacob see each other, they fall on each other's necks and weeping and possibly kissing, but possibly squeezing each other. Um, it's not really clear. But the point is that Jacob says, okay, you know, I'll reach you where you live. I'm coming to Seir. I'm coming to Edom. But the fact is, he never goes there. One of the things that figures into this reconciliation is hinted at in Daniel 11:41, and it's talking about the rule of the anti-Messiah. We see several references that there are ten kingdoms. There are three of them that he does not overcome. And so it's speaking of the anti-Messiah, it says, He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. So because anti-Messiah does not have his hand over a dome, Bible scholars presume that in the time of fleeing, which we'll read about in a minute, that the, that the Jews will flee to that area, um, which is in modern-day Jordan. In Mark 13, 14, and other places, but when you shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Now there was a partial fulfillment of this in the first century when um, the Jews fed, fled to uh, an area called Pella to escape the destruction of Jerusalem. But there is a future fulfillment. And many Bible scholars believe that the place that they will flee is to uh, Petra, 
which is um, in southern Jordan, and it is in the land of Edom. And so it seems possible that at that time there will be a reconciliation, possibly between uh, Jordanian believers who will understand the times as the Jews are fleeing, and they will uh, help them and give them sanctuary and be part of their reconciliation to their Messiah, Yeshua. In fact, in going back and looking at the section that James uh, Yaakov quoted in Acts when he was talking about the fall intent of David from Amos, we see that he didn't exactly quote the scripture that's in Amos as it is written. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen, all the nations which are called by my name, saith Yahweh that doeth this. So this is a time of reconciliation. We see that the uh, Gentiles are coming in to the fold, to the believing fold. They are being uh, reconciled and unified with God's body, with his family. And in the end of days, even the remnant of Edom, Jacob will flee to that area. He, he promised he would meet Esau there. He never went. At that time, he will go there and there will be reconciliation. Until that day, tasimita inayim al hashamayim. Keep your eyes on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.